I share that view with severe reservations. You have a lot of people talking about how electric vehicles are going to use five times or eight times as much silver as a conventional ICE engine. In reality, if you talk to the auto industry and you look at the engineers and engineering reports, they're probably going to use one and a half to two times as much silver. So I look at automobiles and electronics and the electrification, and I say, this is all good for silver, but I think there's a tremendous amount of overly enthusiastic bullishness and, and that has two effects. First off, um, well, the main effect is that, and I, this is one of the reasons why we see a weaker silver price and lower investment demand for silver next year compared to gold, is there are a lot of investors who have listened to a lot of bad information and they bought silver at you know $28, $30, and they were expecting $100, and now it's $24, $25. And you're seeing a lot of bearishness and a lot of, you know, there's a lot of dissatisfaction uh, that they were sold, sold a bill of goods. And I think one of the things that we're going to see, and I think I've talked to you about electric vehicles uh, and going yeah. forward, I think one of the things that you're going to see in 2022 is a much closer scrutiny of what electric vehicles and the green energy revolution actually mean, both for the economy and for individual metals, everything from copper and nickel down to silver. You know, if you look at the International Energy Agency's big report this year on the effect on metals, critical minerals and metals of the green energy revolution, silver's not in there. They're not worried about silver, you know, and I think that there is going to be any number of investors. There already are a number of investors who are showing their dissatisfaction for silver relative to gold because they feel they've been sold a bill of goods by over promoters. And I think that that's going to continue to weigh on silver relative to gold in 2022. So you're not a quote unquote stacker, as they might say. Jeff. No, you know, it's funny. I am a stacker. I mean, I've been stacking silver for <laughs> since the 80s, you know, yeah. so uh, but I'm a, a rational stacker. I understand. Yeah. You know, and I don't ever expect to have to use it to buy milk and bread at the corner store. <laughs> That's interesting because uh, 150 years ago you could, and uh, 150 years ago you had to. Yeah, you know, if you go back to the expansion of the United States to the West, you know, you you didn't have a central bank, you didn't have a central currency. Currency bills were issued by regional banks, state banks, and you know, it's like so. I'm in Ohio. I want to move to Kansas. Uh, I take my money out of the bank. I go to Kansas and I say, well, I've got all these uh, bills issued by the first bank of, of Canton, Ohio. And the banker in Canton says, where's that? You know, so what you did was you went to the bank and you said, give me Spanish silver coins, hmm. pieces of eight. And pieces of eight were the major currency used in the Western expansion of the United States. You know, if you wanted to buy milk and bread, or as my wife says, you know, we don't know how the pioneers like went across the country uh, without like a steady flow of coffee. <laughs> you know? uh, but, you know, if you wanted to buy stuff, you converted your money into silver. You know, when all of those people came out of Europe and came to the United States, they didn't bring Lithuanian currency. They went to the Lithuanian bank and they said, I'm moving to America. Yeah. Give me silver. Well, why did that change? Well, it changed uh, for a variety of reasons. One was the rise of central banks. Yeah. And you had all of a sudden you had more stable banking. Yeah. You know, the reason why we had banking panic after bank panic in the 19th century was because you didn't have a central banking system and you didn't have effective oversight. You had all these state banks. You know, you had no central bank, no national bank. Uh, you had uh, state chartered banks. The states didn't have the wherewithal to really monitor them. So there was this constant thing of, well, listen, Mr. Banker, you have to have a certain amount of gold and silver in your, your safe to back the currencies you're issuing. And then the bankers would slowly but surely realize no one's coming in to check their books to see if they had it. So they would overprint uh, notes and then the notes would bomb and everybody would come down and say, give me your gold and silver. And there wouldn't be enough gold and silver. You go into a depression and then you go into an inflation. You know, and you had this boom and bust cycle. 
And that was true in the United States, but it was also true to a lesser extent in a lot of other countries. So in the late part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, you had the rise of central banks and you had greater scrutiny and regulatory oversight of banking. And that caused those bills to be more trustworthy. Uh, it's a little bit clouded because of the Turkish uh, use of gold in, in monetary policies. But if you look at non-Turkish central bank activity, what you saw, and it, I think it's important for the future, because what you saw was a number of central banks, you know, central banks tend to be more price sensitive than private investors, and they tend to wait for lower prices. And what we saw in the first half of this year was central banks buying between, say, 1740 and 1840 really 1780 and 1820. Uh, so that sort of signals that central bankers as a group were sort of looking at the gold market and saying, okay, you know, $1,800 used to be the record price, uh, but now it's probably a good price to buy from a long-term perspective. You know, you got to remember, central bankers don't have an investment horizon the way uh, institutional investors or private investors, they don't say, you know, what's the what's the outlook for gold for the next three to five years? They say, what's the outlook for gold going forward? And what they're basically doing is they're signaling that they think $1,800 is a cheap price for gold on a long-term basis. And have you noticed um, a divergence between gold and silver prices this year? Well, yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think that uh, the gold price has held up better than the silver price in the second in the second half this year. I think the silver price probably outperformed gold, if I if I remember, a little bit in the first half of the year. But then again, you had this dissatisfaction with yeah. the overselling of silver, and so I think you had a weaker silver price in the second half of this year mm -hmm. than you did gold prices. I, I bring that up because I, I'm assuming you are projecting this divergence to last going into next year because you're projecting gold to go up slightly in the order of maybe 2% from current price, uh, sorry, just a you know, few hundred bucks from current yeah. prices and silver to go down 2%. So they're moving in different directions according to your outlook. I'm wondering, well, you've explained that, but typically in the past, we've seen gold uh, and silver move in the same direction with silver outperforming in bull markets, right? So that, that doesn't seem to be the case with your analysis for 2022. It's, you know, they move broadly in in, to, in in the same direction. You know, the correlation historically, since gold prices were freed in 1968, 1970, the correlation between changes in silver prices and changes in gold prices is 78%. So you have 22% of the time, uh, you can have divergences in the gold and silver uh, price movement, direction, and size. And so it's not that surprising. What I, I think what you're seeing is, you know, on the one hand, I said, you know, some investor dissatisfaction with silver uh, because they feel they've been lied to. Uh, but you also have a much broader base of investors globally interested in gold. So, it, it, you know, it's not just a U.S. market. It's a global market. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the Middle East or Southeast Asia or, or Europe, you'll find a greater proclivity toward investing in gold as a safe haven than in silver. They like silver and they use silver, but not as much as gold. Okay. Uh, Jeff, there's uh, many different uh, 